Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here in Sydney. How do you like our Heartland special here? You know, Harry Truman rode this state in his whistle stop tour of 1948. And uh, he spoke some very blunt truths. And that's what I'm going to do. He, we're now three and a half weeks away from election day, and the American people are getting the full flavor of the clear choice that's facing them. It's a choice between two fundamentally different ways of governing and two different ways of looking at America. My opponent, Mr. Mondale, offers a future of pessimism, fear, and limits compared to ours of hope, confidence, and growth. Now, I don't, I don't fault his intentions. I know his intentions are good and that he means well. But we see things differently. He sees government as an end in itself, and we see government as something belonging to the people and only a junior partner in our lives. They see people merely as members of groups, special interests to be coddled and catered to. Well, we look at them as individuals to be fulfilled through their own freedom and creativity. My opponent and his allies live in the past. They are celebrating the old and failed policies of an era that has passed them by, as if history had skipped over those Carter Mondale years. On the other hand, Millions of Americans join us in boldly charting a new course for the future. From the beginning, their campaign has lived on promises. Indeed, Mr. Bondale has boasted that America is nothing if it is not promises. Well, the American people don't want promises, and they don't want to pay for his promises. I think you want promise. You want opportunity and workable answers. It's fitting that we're campaigning today on Harry Truman's train, following the same route he took 36 years and one day ago. He was the last Democrat that I voted for. Indeed, I campaigned for him in 1948. Yes, I spent a great deal of my life as a Democrat. I respected Harry Truman's ability to stand for what he believes, his consistency of principles, and his determination to do the right thing. And Mr. Truman could also make very plain the differences between himself and an opponent. And that's what I'm going to try to do today. Let's start with the record, the record of the administration in which Mr. Mondale carried a full partnership. He, Mr. Carter himself said, there wasn't a single decision I made during four years in the White House that Fritz Mondale wasn't involved in. Well, in those four years, they took the strongest economy in the world and they pushed it to the brink of collapse. They created a calamity of such proportions that we're still suffering the consequences of those economic time bombs. That was no fresh-faced, well-fed baby they left on our doorstep in January of 1981. It was a snarling economic wolf with sharp teeth. The suffering of America, the deep and painful recession, and the outrageous and frightening inflation, these things didn't start by accidental ignition or spontaneous combustion. They came about through the concerted mismanagement of an administration of which Mr. Mondale was a part and his liberal friends who controlled the Congress. They gave us five. In little more than a year, five anti-inflation plans, five different economic plans. And with them, they managed to give us the worst four-year record of inflation in nearly 40 years. While it took them five plans to nearly triple inflation, it's only taken us one to cut it down by two-thirds. Senior citizens were driven into panic by higher rents, exorbitant fuel costs, dramatically increasing food prices, 
and a federal health care cost which went up in those four years, 87 percent. And they call that fairness. They punished the poor and the young who struggled as prices of necessity shot up faster than others. Millions of Americans led a life of daily economic terror fueled by these unrelenting costs. Well, let's look at interest rates. My opponent has referred to something he calls real interest rates. Well, people don't pay interest rates based on some academic smokescreen or foggy economic theory. What they know is that when Jerry Ford left office, the prime rate was six and a quarter percent. And when Mr. Mondale left, it was 21 and a half percent, the highest in 120 years. All right. <laughs> okay, you talked me into it. <laughs> hey. Hey. But in that time, the average monthly mortgage payments more than doubled. Young people couldn't buy homes. Car loans were hard to get and expensive. The auto and the home building industries were brought to their knees. It's little wonder that the American people were yearning for leadership back in 1980. After all this economic punishment, our opponents blamed you for living too well, said that's what was at fault, and that you had to sacrifice more. Well, I found that it's not so much that our opponents have a poor memory of this ruinous past, they just have a darn good forgettery. <laughs> and one of the things they like most to forget is the misery index. You remember that? That was where they added the unemployment rate and the inflation rate together. And in 1976, in that campaign, the misery index was 12.6. And they declared that Jerry Ford had no right to seek re-election, being responsible for that kind of a misery index, 12.6. But now came the 1980 campaign and they never mentioned the misery index. And I don't think my opponent will mention it in this campaign, possibly because when he left the vice presidency, the misery index was more than 20%, and now it's only 11.6. He's, he's done a little slipping and sliding and ducking away from this record, but here in Ohio during the primaries, Senator Gary Hart got his message through by reminding the Ohio voters of the true record. And I quote, Senator Hart said, Walter Mondale may pledge stable prices, but Carter Mondale couldn't cut 12% inflation. Walter Mondale, he added, has come to Ohio to talk about jobs, but Carter Mondale watched helpless as 180,000 Ohio jobs disappeared in the period between 1976 and 1980. Those are Gary Hart's words. Well, those disastrous consequences didn't come about by accident. They came through the implementation of the very policies of out-of-control spending, unfair taxation, and worship of big government that my opponent still supports. His philosophy can be summed up in four sentences. If it's income, tax it. If it's revenue, spend it. If it's a budget, break it. And if it's a promise, make it. <laughs> All this year, he has lavished his campaign with promises that staggered even his own Democratic opponents in the primary. Your own Senator Glenn was heard to say in frustration that Mr. Mondale, and I quote, has just promised everything to everybody with no thought of how it's going to be paid for. And then he said, Fritz, you cannot lead this country if you've promised everybody everything. But of course, there is a predictable answer by one who makes so many promises. His answer is higher taxes and massive new tax increases are precisely what he proposes. A few weeks back, he called his new plan, pay as you go. What it is, of course, is nothing but the old plan. You pay and he goes. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. 
Those tax increases to pay for his promises add up to the equivalent of $1,890 per household. If Harry Truman had to apply a motto to this radical taxing scheme, he'd have to say that not your buck stops here, your buck never stops. <laughs> when the centerpiece of his economic program is back-breaking tax hikes, you can see why my opponent spends so much time using outrageous scare tactics. Now, that's not my opponent's only tax extravaganza. He came up with still another one in our debate. He said, and I quote, as soon as we get the economy on a sound ground as well, I would like to see the total repeal of indexing. Now, this tax is even worse because it would be a dagger at the heart of every low and middle income taxpayer in America. It would mean bone crushing new levies against those who can least afford them. Indexing was a reform that we passed, goes into effect on January 1st, this coming year, to protect you from the cruel hidden tax when government uses inflation to force you into higher tax brackets when you've maybe just gotten a cost of living pay raise trying to keep even. Under his plan, here's what would happen to a family struggling on $10,000 per year. By 1989, they would be paying over 73% more in income taxes. For families making $30,000 a year, this tax would take over $500 more in 89, nearly 900 a year more for those making 40,000, and these assume modest inflation. If we had their higher double-digit inflation rates back, then all those tax collections would more than double. And we're told that he misspoke, that he actually meant to say just the opposite. But on several occasions since 1982, he has expressly proposed the repeal of indexing. He's done this quite often. In politics, they call this sometimes flip-flops. In this case, forgive me, I'm going to call it a Fritz flop. <laughs> Indexing is one example, but there are many others. Yesterday, he wanted to give a $200 tax break to every family dependent. Today, he wants to raise taxes the equivalent of $1,890 per household. You know, he's done a lot of talk lately about that there's a new and an older Reagan. And um, he doesn't mean my age when he's talking that. He means that the old Reagan said things differently than the new Reagan is saying them. Well, the old Monde and Bale said that tightening the budget and reducing deficits would worsen a recession. And the new Mondale thinks higher taxes lead to a healthy economy. The old Mondale publicly supported Jimmy Carter's wrong-headed grain embargo, and the new Mondale claims he opposed it privately. Awful privately. No one else ever heard him. The old Mondale sponsored National Bible Week in the United States Senate. I think that's fine. The new Walter Mondale says there's too much religion in politics. The old Mondale called the space shuttle a horrible waste, a space extravaganza, and led the fight to kill it in the Senate. The new Mondale praises American technological achievement. But just when you're beginning to lose faith, you find there is some constancy. The old Mondale increased your taxes, and the new Mondale will increase them again. You know, you know, in our debate, I got a little angry that all those times he distorted my record. And on one occasion, I was about to say to him very sternly, Mr. Mondale, you are taxing my patience. <laughs> and then I caught myself. Why should I give him another idea? <laughs> That's the only tax he hasn't thought about. Well, from now until November 6th, we're going to make sure that the American people know about this choice on which their future depends. We have two roads to tomorrow. We have the road of fear and envy that he proposes, and on his road you frighten the elderly with false statements. You strive to divide Americans against each other, seeking to promote envy and promote and portray greed. Franklin Roosevelt warned us that the only thing we had to fear was fear itself. Well, sadly and tragically, 
I think the only thing my opponent has to offer is fear itself. When I said the elderly citizens being frightened, again these repeated charges that somehow we're nursing a secret plan to undercut the people who are on Social Security, reduce or remove their benefits. I said it on Sunday night and I will say it again. There is no one in this administration, and if there was, they wouldn't be here long, that has any intention of taking Social Security away from those people who have it and who deserve it. We see things differently, as I said, because we see ourselves in a springtime of hope ready to fire up our courage and determination to reach high and achieve all the best. We see a life where our children can enjoy, at last, prosperity without inflation. We see a life where they can enjoy the highest of creativity and go for the stars, not have their hopes and dreams crushed by politicians or taxed away by greedy governmentalists. The American people are walking in tomorrow, into tomorrow unashamed and afraid. And again, I have to say something that I've been saying so often across this country, and I mean it with all my heart. One of the most thrilling things is to see so many young Americans present at these rallies. Let me, let me tell you, let me tell you, you, you are what this campaign and this election are all about. There's one thing that the rest of us and the people of my generation have to do before we leave the scene, and that is restore this country, as I think we've begun to do, so that one day you will find the same America of unlimited hope and opportunity that we were promised and found when we were young that had been left to us by our parents. You know, I know you're ready for great opportunity, and I know this may gall our opponents, but it's time for the train to move on, and I think maybe you'll all agree with me when I say just one more line. We've, we think we've made a good beginning, but you ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just add a little postscript, and then I've got to get on that train. I know in a crowd this size there must be many of you who are Democrats, as I once was. And I must say this, you're not only welcome, but if you are here, I think you're here because, like happened to me once, you no longer can follow the policies of the leadership of your party. It's true for millions of patriotic, right-thinking Democrats throughout this country. Well, I say to all of you, if you are here, don't be alone. Come on along with us, and between the two of us, between all of us, we'll get this whole thing straightened out day after tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, look at that big green Great sign, right there. We've got a presentation for you, Mr. President. Hello, Mr. President. This is the mayor of the city, Jim Humphrey, and he has a little proclamation to make, if I may. Excuse me. Mr. President, the people of Sydney and Shelby County work hard and as you can see they enjoy life. The people here today and those not able to be here are the kind of people who make their own way in the world and pay for it themselves. It is our pleasure to present to you this plaque representing products
produced by the working people of our community, industry, commerce, and agriculture. Mr. President, it is an honor to welcome you to our community, the garden spot of the world, and also the logo of the city of Sydney, Ohio, USA. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you all very much. This is, oh, I'm very honored to have this, and honored by all of you. Thank you, Mr. Reagan. I know your train has to leave. Thank you for joining us here in Sydney, Ohio today.